regrettably, particularly in the public imagination uh, by inclusion and by celebration of others, but rather by its exclusion. Tonight, we get to remember that at the core of many of our faith traditions and within the life specifically of Pacific School of Religion, inclusion, expansion have been at the core of what faith that motivates us and animates us. And the reality is that for many people in the world, uh, faith, conviction, uh, continue to be an animating force. And so it is an opportunity for us to really celebrate with pride who we are fully, for many of us understanding that as created in the image of God. Uh, for our panelists tonight, I am delighted to be joined by the Reverend uh, Loie Powell. Loie Powell uh, retired in 2016 from the nominational offices of the United Church of Christ after serving in various positions of leadership for almost 20 years. Lori began, uh, Lori, Lori, sorry, <laughs> began her national setting ministry in 1996 when she was called to serve as the executive director for the Coordinating Center for Women in Church and Society, one of the offices uh, that provided a distinctive focus to the United Church of Christ. Justice and advocacy for women continue to be a central uh, uh, part of Lori's work. Lori uh, graduated from PSR uh, in 1976, and at her ordination, she made history as she, together with two other PSR alums, uh, you know, celebrated their ordination together in uh, what really at the time was a significant statement uh, of uh, challenging the convictions of many religious traditions about the role of women and is still at that moment, but particularly the role of uh, LGBTQ women in the society. We are also joined tonight by uh, Ryan Casada. Ryan is a musician, a public speaker, a writer, a filmmaker, an actor, and an activist. He uh, is well known, uh, perhaps to many of you who are on the call as well because of his advocacy and his music. Uh, he is also a PSR alum, and he has spent uh, already a significant portion of his life making an incredible impact in the society and the community, particularly around a variety of uh, issues around inclusion, but particularly around the importance of inclusion and celebration of trans lives. And so we are grateful, Ryan, for being with us tonight. Uh, as we begin our conversation, uh, I just wanna say one last thing, which is that uh, we wanted to mark this webinar tonight, uh, both as part of the celebration of pride, but also uh, to celebrate uh, in, in coordination with this uh, moment, the 50th anniversary of the ordination of the first gay men, out gay men uh, into a uh, mainline denomination. Bill Johnson was ordained in 1972, 50 years ago. Uh, Bill was also a PSR alum and, uh, or is still is a PSR alum. Uh, and he, at his ordination, he again was one of the first in making a significant transformative experience. Uh, Bill had hoped to join us tonight, but didn't feel quite well enough to be able to do that. But I wanna just name and celebrate his legacy, his work, uh, as well as that of our two uh, panelists today. So let me start out with a brief uh, call. And I appreciate it, Holly has corrected. I think, uh, Ryan, I already graduated US and alumnix, not quite yet. Um, <laughs> Ryan is a student at PSR right now. I think I said alumnix at one point. Uh, so uh, let me ask you both, uh, but I'll start out with Loi, to tell us a little bit about, Loi, your coming out story. When did it happen? What was the context, the social context in which you came out? And what did that mean to you as a political act? Yeah, thank you. And, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be here for this uh, particular occasion and glad, David, that you lifted up Bill Johnson who is a dear friend and um, who made a lot of things possible for many of us uh, who followed into ordination and into ministry after um, his historic ordination. Um, well, it's an interesting thing for me. Um, I took a year off after I graduated from college. I went to Oberlin College and then I took a year off before coming to PSR. I had been accepted, but I wasn't quite ready to go for whatever reason and I didn't really know what those reasons were. Um, 
as, as I have pondered all of that over the <laughs> over the years, um, I kind of was struggling with my sexuality during that time and didn't know it, had no words for it at all. Um, so when I arrived at PSR in the um, 1974, the fall of 1974, because I graduated in 77, actually, uh, I was in Berkeley, California. I was in this wonderful place and space. Uh, and there were uh, at least two out lesbians who entered the same class that I did. Um, and things just sort of began to come together for me. And um, I realized before going home for Christmas break that that is who I was. I was a lesbian. I was one of those, I was probably one of those women that uh, everybody else knew I was a lesbian, but I didn't know it until I actually knew it. So I went home and I told my parents. Um, and uh, fortunately for me, uh, my parents are absolutely loving and wonderful people. And they, um, they just embraced me. And if they had issues, if they had things that they were struggling through, they dealt with it with other people and not with me. So in that regard, I was extraordinarily fortunate. But I also came out in at the time of uh, when feminist theology, when black liberation theology, when uh, Central and South American liberation theologies, uh, womanist theologies were all coming together and into seminary life and into our courses and our coursework. Uh, and the Bay Area was like Mecca. Berkeley was like Mecca for lesbians. So we had plenty of places to gather, to meet, to do things, to be supported. Uh, and the campus was one of those places. Uh, where we were not afraid at all to be who we were. My uh, partner at the time uh, in our third year there were the first to uh, be same-sex couple to occupy married student housing because the dean of students then, Barbara Troxell, said, well, I know you can't get married, but if you consider yourself married and you know whatever, well, sure. So that happened uh, and that was good. It was also um, it was also a time of tremendous crisis in the Bay Area, especially like in New York and like in L.A. and some other places uh, with the AIDS pandemic constantly in our faces. And one of the things that was happening were was that a lot of lesbians were beginning to provide support for gay men. Uh, who were dealing with HIV AIDS uh, in many ways. There was a Shanti project that provided counseling. Uh, we did what we could um, and to, to counsel and to support because the, the, the level of death and grieving and all of that was just um, almost too much to take in at times. Uh, so that was one of the you know, it's like you learn very early, you get out of yourself and you get into the world where things were happening. But there were multiple things happening. We were engaged in uh, farm worker movements. Uh, we were engaged in the anti-apartheid movement. Um, so the intersection of the isms and the issues that were impacting people's lives, people's everyday lives, were reinforced by what we were learning at seminary, but also by what we were doing um, at actively on the ground as well. Um, so, you know, that's, that's part of the context of my coming out. I couldn't have chosen a better uh, seminary to go to. We sometimes, we know, many of us at PSR knew people who were lesbians who were in, uh, on the East Coast in the Boston area, seminaries and things who were so scared of coming out, they weren't gonna tell anybody anything about themselves. And we like, what, you know, come to Berkeley, this is great. So. That was, you know, it was a joy to be there. It was an absolute joy to be there. Um, and because I got the support I got both from my family and from my community in the church and in seminary, um, 
I was able to be an advocate. I didn't have to hide. Uh, I didn't have to worry about getting tossed out of a family or, or other places. So I learned and I learned from Bill Johnson that you just come out and be who you are, wherever you are. And come out and be who you are and everywhere you are. So we fast forward a few decades and add <laughs> the context for Ryan's uh, story. So Ryan, please, if you wanna share with us a bit about your coming out story and the context in which you came out and the, your sense about the political statement that this may mean in a different time. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone's here, welcome. Um, I'm very excited to be part of this and very honored. I have been out for over half of my life now at this point i started to come out when i was 12 years old and this was i was i was on long island in new york i lived in a conservative town and i knew who i was at a very young age and i basically was not going to let anyone tell me that you know who i was besides myself and i was very sure of myself and i started to come out around age 12, first to my parents and then to friends and then extended family members. And this was at a time where being uh, trans, I mean, no one said trans, like that wasn't even a word that was part of our language yet. It was, we would say transsexual or transgender, but mostly transsexual at that time. And this was at a time where not many people were out, especially not young people. Um, when I came out, there was one website on the internet to get information about being a trans guy. There was six surgeons in the entire country that would perform a gender reassignment surgery. There were um, just a few trans YouTubers and there was no one really that was successful there. You know, to, to my parents, it looks like there was very little hope for me when I came out and I I was the first out trans person in my high school I was the first out trans person in, uh, out queer person in my middle school and my high school is where Harvey Milk graduated from actually so um, that is what ended up bringing me to the Bay Area his his story and I wanted to follow in his footsteps and um, he also inspired me a lot to be an activist, but at the time of me coming out, it was either I become an activist or I don't go to school because I can't. Um, I wasn't allowed to use the bathroom. I wasn't allowed to change for gym. There's all of these things that the other students were allowed to do and I wasn't allowed to do. So I would um, be in the hallway with petitions and I would walk out of classrooms and and protest for real. And uh, for me, it was it was survival. It was the only way I was able to be at school. And I, and I wanted to be at school. And um, when I was 15 years old, I went on the Larry King live show. I think I, I think I was the youngest trans guy on television on international television. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> and I, I went on the Larry King live show and that's how I came out to everyone all at once. So um, besides for my family and my close friends, that's how I came out. And everyone now knows I'm trans. And of course that comes with like more backlash. And I just kept um, educating and I knew that you know, the bullies were, they were coming at me. Um, they were, it was, you know, verbal, it was violent. It was very dangerous. And I knew that the only way that I could reach them was to educate them. That was the only way was to come at them from a place of compassion and say, you know, my, my parents didn't understand at first either. My brothers didn't understand at first either. Like, let me share my experience with you. And let's sit down because we're, we're both human beings and look like we both like music, you know? So like, let's find this common ground and meet there and then they will listen to the education. So very young, I became an activist, um, going, traveling all over the United States, speaking wherever 
they would have me wherever I was called to speak. And that my coming out, my coming out experience was very much wrapped up in that. And the context of that time was that I had to be an activist. And, and I don't have any regrets about that. So inviting. Thank you for sharing your story, both as challenge and its gift. I want to encourage you to have a conversation with each other about, uh, you know, the, the saying goes that uh, the personal is political. So if you can engage with each other about that reality of how your personal life, your personal identity, who you are, uh, how has that been political? Where has been the opportunity? Where has been the challenge? What is it? What is the price? Or what is the uh, uh, the gift that it has been to you? I think that uh, one of the things that I, I hear in your story, Ryan, um, is the sharpness of the struggle. Uh, and I think we are living in a time now where and when uh, those of us uh, because of our skin color, our ethnicity, our gender identity orientation, uh, however we define ourselves, is being used by the right wing uh, to, uh, we're the focus now, and women are the focus now, like around abortion and things like that, because they, it's like the majority want, they're so desperate to maintain power somehow. You know, the white male straight Christian, supposed Christian person. Um, so how is it you um, how is it you respond to that sort of growing culture that wants to use violence, that wants to throw laws at us, uh, want to pre prevent anybody from saying gay or anything, you know, in school? Uh, how do you deal with that today? Yeah, I think that that's a very good question. And I think I felt when, when I was younger, I felt almost more um, I was just so like, let's get this done. Let's get this done. And I, and I would really um, sacrifice like my mental health and my self-care to put my life on the line for whatever um, cause for the trans community. And now like as I've gotten older, I've realized like I need to take some time to, to rest and, and I, I feel the impact more now. And I think I'm allowing myself to feel the impact more. So recently um, in the United States, there's been many bills and legislation that is affecting trans youth, um, trans people, but mostly trans youth. And I, and I was a trans youth, you know? And I, I feel so much empathy. And I mean, I spent like several days, like just feeling that, like I, I was, I felt heavy and a few times I like broke down and cried. And then, and I feel, I feel all that so much. And for me dealing with that first, I realized now like, Hey, I need to give myself the time to process. Mm -hmm. And if that means like I need to cry for two days before I go out and speak about this publicly, like that's what I have to do because or else I'm not gonna be able to speak about it, you know, and but I have to allow myself to feel to feel it. Um, when I was younger, I feel like I just like blocked that the feeling and was like, no, we have to we just have to keep moving forward. And um, there's only so long as an activist that you could last like that before you burn out. Um, so. I, the way I respond to that, like to answer your question is with music. And um, I decided in um, this, this year, like in May, I went, I went and I spoke and performed all over uh, California and Nevada. And I decided like, you know what, all my shows, I want them to be open to youth. I want them to be, be all ages shows. I want them to be shows where it's music, but there's also a conversation and a time for me to connect with everyone there and connect those people so that they're less alone. And I, I went out with this mission and like, that's exactly what happened. And there's young people that 
when they saw me, they just had to hug me so tight and mm. were asking, can I, can I have one more hug before I go? And um, I wrote songs specifically about the legislation and I played them and, and I wanted these, I want the young trans people to know that they're not alone. We're, we're all going through this and we will get through it. Like things are a lot better than they were uh, when I came out. We have a very, very long way to go, but I see the progress. And with that, I see a lot of hope. I feel a lot of hope. And we need to hold on to that hope. And those young people need that feeling of hope to be able to survive. So that's where, um, that's what I, what I set out to do. I mean, I combined the music with the activism so that I could do that and reach those young people to fight back against this anti trans legislation. I'm uh, very encouraged to hear that. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why, because for like, I'm 71 years old now <laughs> for 50 years or more, I have been engaged on all the issues that right now are like coming right back, being thrown right back in our face. I'm someone who had an abortion pre row um, I'm someone, even though it sounds like a Cinderella story, my coming out and all of that and a positive thing, I spent seven years unable to get a call to ministry in the United Church of Christ. Um, so I had to work in a whole range of jobs. Uh, you know, I was a receptionist. I worked in a moving company. Uh, the best period I had during that time was working with Polly Near and Redwood Records in Oakland. Um, so it was hard. I could have thrown my hands up and said, I'm, I'm done with it. I'm done with ministry. But I stayed engaged in the church in, a vol in volunteer ways, uh, which was really important for me. And I stayed engaged in our you know, coalition, uh, our LBGTQ coalition in, in the UCC. Um, and, and now with these things coming, waiting moment by moment for the Supreme Court to come out on abortion to do this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, and what is happening in state laws that you mentioned around trans youth, especially. It's like, where the hell have we been? What has happened? All of this work, you know, the progressive movement, all of this work, where, did we just go away or something? Mm. And I don't think we have, but I don't think we have understood as deeply as we have needed to that we need to stay engaged in multiple ways. And we need to learn the breadth of our movement. You know, when I started out, it was in the UCC, Bill Johnson and I were the co-national directors and it was called United Church of Christ Gay Caucus. And then it became the Gay and Lesbian Caucus. Then it became the Gay and Lesbian Bisexual Caucus and finally became a coalition of LBGTQ. And now it's the coalition of, you know, open and affirming coalition um, because we needed to, embrace everyone. It took us a long time in the UCC coalition work to really understand our own racism and to know that there was a Bishop Yvette Flunder who was organizing and working with, you know, so profoundly with people of color uh, across the country. It took us forever to, to um, kind of come to terms with who we are and to truly be the and have the extravagant welcome that we in the United Church of Christ promote and say we are all the time. So we have learning curves, but I'm so encouraged to hear you talk about your engagement and, and hope and the young people who are coming uh, to your concerts and coming to you. Um, that gives me hope. Thank you. I, I do want to ask you, why do you think all of these issues are coming up so much right now? Like, it seems like um, all the minority groups, like more now than in the last few years, it's just it all of this legislation is coming right now. It's the culture war, uh, the right wing. It's the only thing they can do. They can't deal with issues that positively impact people's lives. So they have to get their base 
organized and energized. So they become, they put out the anti-gay, anti-trans, anti-woman, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's how they organize and they've done it very well over the years. They're very patient. Uh, and now we're at a time where it is all on the table. Um, you know, Trump and his allies have, have flame, inflamed the base uh, in new ways and uh, people who, people have just lost their, their integrity, <laughs> many of them, uh, or just because they want to get reelected, they want to, you know, whatever, you know, it's power. Um, and I think that they fear uh, this country, they, they can't deal with the fact that this country is as diverse as it is, mm -hmm. that we are who we are, that we have multiple cultures and multiple peoples here. Uh, who want to be here, and they can't deal with it because they want us all to be just like them. And we're not. They're not going to be. I mean, my spouse of 26 years is an African-American woman. So every single day, every single day, I'm aware of the racism of this country and how it personally affects people. Um, that has changed me. That has changed my life. And that has opened up my eyes to my own racism and my own need to be um, uh, active and actively anti-racist every day in every encounter. So. You know, I think as you asked that question, Ryan, that, you know, what, what, what's happening, right? I encourage folks, if you have not had a chance to read The Third Reconstruction uh, by William Barber, Dr. Uh, William mm -hmm. Barber, uh, Reverend Dr. William Barber, and Bishop William Barber. Uh, in the third reconstruction, how a moral movement is overcoming the politics of division and fear. He wrote the book in 2016 and has become to me even more prophetic. But part of what he uh, articulates in the third reconstruction is the idea that following uh, the period of expansion uh, of the, you know, the, the abolition of slavery uh, as the nation, you know, went through this major struggle to expand uh, the definition of, uh, you know, of, of inclusion that it was immediately followed by a period of retraction that yeah. it started out by the reduction of taxes and all of this fear mongering that actually tried to reduce and make it unable for the government to live out the commitments it had made in the reconstruction. A similar cycle happened during the civil rights movement, which he terms as the second reconstruction. This, again, a moment of the expansion of rights and inclusions, and then followed by this retraction, a very conservative period that followed in terms of politics, uh, taxation, that then limited the ability of government to do that. And we are now in this third cycle, in which has been a movement towards expansion that is being followed by a period of retraction. Uh, and in each of those, the hopeful part of the book is in each of those, it has been a coalition of people that have traditionally been divided from each other by the political system uh, that has banded together, has fused together to, to try to counter those forces. So where do you both see a space for hope? Ryan, you talked a bit about that, I uh, and Loi as well, but can you say more about where, where, where are you seeing what Personally, politically, where where do you where do you get your energy? <laughs> what gives you hope? I think I would say getting to see these this next generation of young trans people. Um, like I, you know, I, I go to the schools and I, I go into the schools and I see they're out and they're talking about pronouns and they're wearing uh, the pride flags and they're, they're brave and they're, they're fearless and they're unapologetic. Um, and that gives me so much hope because I like, even growing up, I would try as hard as I could to, to blend in so that I didn't face violence um and now realizing like if if i if i face violence because i'm wearing a, a pride flag like that's actually not my fault right that's that's a that's homophobia that's transphobia and that that's not that's not my like my responsibility um to like change who i am to fit in right and and these young people they they know that they already know that and they are living 
like more freely and seeing that is is giving me a lot of hope yeah. i i think david that um and ryan i see hope in in um more people willing to want to hear the truth um almost on any issue that is critical to them it could be climate change uh, and there are, you know, there are young people engaged in that movement. But seeing who is showing up in in various marches uh, on social justice issues around the country and nationally, uh, the generations are there. The young people are there, and they care. And you see high school students uh, going on strike uh, if their high school is trying to ban talking about sexuality and things like that, uh, or racism. Uh, so I find tremendous hope um, in that. I find hope in things like the, the, Jan the Select Committee on January 6th being on television and putting the truth out there. You know, that I have hope that there actually will be charges, you know, <laughs> made to some of the people who have been clearly breaking the law and violating the constitution. Um, but that's getting out there. Um, and it's a tough world to deal with the realities of social media and who, who watches what kind of TV, what kind of channel, what network, what, what social media platform they're on, um, which has caused so much division. But, but also, you know, I've, had, I've also had conversations like you have Ryan, with people who don't know how to deal with me or don't know how to deal with a, an issue that we, we are on opposite sides of, if we can find some sort of common ground, it could be around food that we both like, that <laughs> starts the conversation. It could be the music. It could be, you know, whatever. You make a little bit of a link um, and that other person becomes more human. And maybe I become more human to them. And the more we're able to do that on one-to-one -one conversations, as well as our mass demonstrations, um, it's all needed. Um, and in the church, you know, the church is an interesting place because it's it's probably the only institution that's generational. You know, you got newborn babies and people over 100 years old, uh, and all those generation, all those people in between. Um, and and what I found. In, in my own journey in the United Church of Christ is um, we had some common beliefs. We had some common practice. We gathered around a common table for communion. And, and that brought us together in ways that were far bigger than what any one of us could ever, ever do. And, and you know, a church community that's trying to be true to our calling to be followers of, of Jesus is, is, uh, is a place where we can uh, embrace the differences and try to understand the differences as well. You know, I, uh, last week or I know, maybe two weeks now, uh, the, you know, both the hotly debated uh, conversation between Biden and Kimmel uh, on late night TV uh, I had lots of things to debate about and think about, but there was one line that really struck me about this. And when he was talking about, you know, Kimmel asked him why he was so optimistic. And, and he said, this generation is going to change everything, is what President Biden said. Mm -hmm. and, and the next thing he said, which I think is to this intergenerational conversation, is what he said is this generation referring to a young generation will change everything. We just have to make sure we don't give up. Mm -hmm. And I think that as we discuss this idea of hope, it's not just some fake fluffy sense, but rather this hanging in there, the sense of saying we cannot afford to lose hope on behalf of uh, Ryan, I heard you said that earlier. It is it, sometimes hard where the source of hope is supposed to be religious communities. And yet again, the greatest arguments still for exclusion are being made on religious terms. So this is one of the reasons BSR uh, is so committed to this conversation. Uh, one of our sponsors for this conversation is the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies here at PSR. So can you both speak just a little bit about 
what is the role of faith for you, given that, you know, oftentimes it, it, it is for many the place of exclusion rather than the place of inclusion? And what, what is the argument you would make for inclusion in our, on religious terms? This, it, you can go on for hours about that one, but, uh, but uh, you know, I recently on uh, somebody on Facebook put a Marcus Borg quote up that says this, the Bible is a human product. It tells us how our religious ancestors saw things, not how God sees things. And I think that uh, just trying to convey that, that yes, there's, there's truth in the Bible, but there, it, it, things are so fluid. Um, and, and it's not that we make things up, but take that love of God, uh, that being created in God's image, which is one of the most liberating things for that I have heard from my transgender friends is I am created in God's image too. Of course you are. Um, you know, taking that and, and, and struggling with it, um, being willing to be wrong sometimes, uh, but but what I, you know, it just drives me nuts when people want to throw Bible verses out there as if that was it, that was the penultimate word of God. When my understanding is we are wrestling today with those words that are there. We're still wrestling with it. What does it mean? What does it mean for us today? Um, and let's try to understand uh, the basic some of the most basic things is we have a relationship with God. We have this wonderful creation in which we live. Uh, what is our relationship to each other? What's it meant to be? And how do we live that out? Um, those are the conversations that I want to have with people, not, oh, it says this, it says this, it says this. So, I don't know. What do you think, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, part of like a big reason why I'm at PSR studying is so that I can get better at at having this conversation and and handling this conversation and I think the people that are using bible verses to say what's right and what's wrong they they're like trying to play god really and I I believe that god loves all of us and god loves queer people and god loves trans people and I, that's what I personally believe and, and like reclaiming God as like, not the God of like, of um, homophobia and transphobia, like God that is unconditional love. Mm -hmm. That has healed me a lot. And that took a very long time for me. But I think that if you want God in your life, you deserve you deserve that like everyone deserves that everyone deserves to feel protected and looked over and, and loved like unconditionally loved and i think that god is for everyone we're going to turn to questions from the community in just a minute and so I invite you all uh, who are listening in to put in your questions in the Q&A. You can kind of move your mouse and at the bottom you'll see a Q&A box that you can click and put questions. As folks begin to put questions in that, uh, uh, Holly will be calling them out in just a minute. But uh, to follow up a little bit, Ryan, on what you just said. So what did people say when you, go, when you said, I'm going to seminary? Or what did you say you were doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, people are still very confused why... <laughs> I'm here and I, I'm personally confused still, you know, but I know that what everything I've been learning so far has aided my activism and I'm, you know, just being more educated, like you, you can't go wrong with that. Right. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning a lot and I have already been asked to preach a few times. So I'm looking forward to that. So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, just following the path really. And I wanna learn as much as I possibly can to be better for my community. 
Okay. Let me just give you one, one bit of advice, Brian. For the first time you preach, don't try to put everything you've been learning in seminary into that sermon. <laughs> it, it, it's just you. like, it's not a really good approach. I tried it once, you know, it didn't work. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and I, and as a preacher, right? So my area is preaching. I, it's one of the classes <laughs> I teach at because I always preaching. But uh, you know, I think oftentimes that we, we'll have a follow up uh, webinar on, on what do we mean by preaching, right? Because yeah. oftentimes that's that's key, right? Like uh, yeah. oftentimes people were here like I don't want you to preach at me, uh, and that's bad preaching. That makes people not <laughs> want you to preach. Good preaching makes you to want to say Amen and let's keep going. And to proclaim and so your preaching takes form in music it takes place in lots of other ways and particularly in our lives certainly as saint francis says you know eh, preach at all times and when necessary use words That's uh, right. so <laughs> uh eh, so holly i'll turn it to you to see what kind of questions we are getting uh for our panelists um, we haven't gotten any yet, but I have one for Ryan, if that's okay. Um, I'd love to know how um, being a PSR and all the educating you've been um, getting, um, has that affected your music? Have you brought that into your music and into your activism? Definitely. I did write, uh, since like being at PSR, I've written a few um, worship and spiritual songs, and that's been fun. Also, I've been able to like a few classes I've been able to use my songs um for example like for this uh for a class last summer social transformation class I spent my time working on a project called uh we march stronger together so it was a song it's a song and I had um like 20 different musicians on it and then I had activists from all over the world send video footage of different marches and rallies and for my project I was able to like call on community for that and I mean I was e able even able um and it was everything was like it came pretty easy to reach everyone and I was shocked by that and that's because I've been like doing activism for so long but I mean, PSR has taught me how to like put all those things together to be able to like work together in groups and and work together to come to a like a um a final project like that. And I was even able to reach Marsha P. Johnson's roommate, Randy Wicker, who wow. was the first openly gay man on television, and uh get all of this archival footage of Marsha P. Johnson that I was able to use in this um, documentary music video. Um, and yeah, so that project, I think it, I mean, it was, you know, it, go, it goes like, it, it aligns with PSR and, and what I'm already doing has aligned so well with what PSR does. So um, I wouldn't, I would say like, yeah, I'm like reading a lot more and writing papers a lot more, but it's all seems very useful for me. Uh, that's awesome. And um, Deborah asked, um, did you both grow up in churches? Were they supportive of you? Um, and what's your church life like now? <laughs> 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 that sounds like we have a good answer coming from Loie. <laughs> Well, I grew up as a preacher's kid, so I grew up, you know, my dad was, you know, a congregational then UCC minister, so that's how I grew up, going to church all of the time. We literally lived for 11 years, you know, four feet away from the church building in the parsonage next door, so, um, so I know that, uh, but I was blessed um, because my father was a very, very wonderful pastor and preacher um, and very well respected uh, and that's one of the reasons I went to PSR because he was so well known on the East Coast. I wanted to, you know, be my own person. So I came out West where he was not as well known. Although Davy Napier did know him uh, when I arrived and he was president. Um, my current church life, it's very interesting. Um, Brenda and I never really found a, a church here in the Cleveland area that really met both of our needs in which is an interesting reality here um, and when I retired uh, as a retired person you can move your standing 
somewhere else if you want to. You don't have to be in the same place. So I actually am a member of the First United Church of Tampa, Florida, where Bernice Powell Jackson is a pastor. Bernice and I uh, work together at the UCC. We're good friends. Uh, it's a very diverse congregation, very justice oriented. Um, so I joined with Zoom and most of uh, uh, that we have hybrid services now and uh, it's been wonderful. So it's very... Uh, yeah. For those of you who are on the webinar on the call and may not be may, may be seeking an opportunity to be in a in community, you know, encourage but but have not had an experience in which church has been, you know, <laughs> you can't assume a welcome, <laughs> you know, and sometimes the sign on the door doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, but an encouraging word to say there are communities seeking to 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 live out more fully their, their an understanding of welcome and and to provide space and community. Um and uh Ryan, I see one in the chat from Theodore uh, saying, I'm a trans man considering PSR. Would you tell me a little bit about your experience? Yeah, um, well, so far I like I've been since I've been in school since February 2021. And I mean, I would say it's like 100 percent welcoming of trans people like I haven't had any issues at all based on being trans I mean I don't even think I've ever been called the wrong pronouns or anything so as far as like being trans and in this school like it's a 100% accepting place and it's a place where I've been able to like unpack what it means to be trans today and find a lot of healing and support on that and also a place where I can just show up as Ryan and it's not like, oh, here's the trans guy Ryan in class. You know, it's like, I could just show up as Ryan. And I feel, you know, I feel equal with to everyone else, so. That's great to hear, and, and, and I wanna say, uh, Theodore and for others as well, a, a couple of things. First, programmatically, you know, the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies, CLGS, uh, has a trans roundtable. Uh, so we are organized around different roundtables, ethnic roundtables uh, for Asian American, African American, Latinx, but then also a trans table. Uh, and one of the, and, and those are communities trying to develop theology from our various perspectives and communities so that it isn't only sort of translating it's straight theology into a new community, but rather to develop a, a theology that comes and is informed by our experiences. Uh, secondly, I, I would say also there's a trans uh, cohort uh, that uh, the that roundtable runs that includes sometimes PSR students, but also trans students across other seminaries. And that's a year long program uh, that, uh, of mentoring support and, and developing theology together. So I encourage folks to, to check that out. And um... Uh, Carlos asks, as ministers um, and gay or trans, what has been the most difficult challenge uh, that you have faced? Yeah, for a while, as I said before, for a while was getting a job, <laughs> getting a call. Um, um, I was out on my, you know, my profile that you send out to churches as a potential candidate and things like that. So I got a lot of rejection letters. Um, and when I finally was called to Unite Church in Tallahassee, Florida, um, I was the first openly gay, lesbian, trans UCC minister called during the regular search process. I was just one name in the, in the hat and they called me. Um, but then I had to meet with the committee on ministry there to, you know, transfer my standing to that conference. Everything went fine. I didn't say who I was because that was clearly in my profile. And I thought they had all read it. But later I learned the conference minister didn't share that because he was too nervous about it. And I had to get called back and called on the carpet for not telling them. And I said, I thought you all knew that. This is not a secret. It was in my profile, you know. Um, so you have, it's dealing with that at times the 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 institutional structures sometimes are insensitive um uneducated and i think as more trans non-binary um uh, people come into ministry uh with 
that people aren't familiar with these categories and they're gonna like, oh my God, what do we do now? Um, it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens and what kind of education our churches are gonna put forward, our, our denominations will put forward to educate people um, about all of that. That's gonna be interesting to see. Um, and Ryan, this question is, uh, and I really hope I'm pronouncing your name right, and I apologize if I'm not, uh, DeLois. Um, Ryan, thank you for being an example of courage. What was it that made you decide to attend seminary? Yeah, um, well, I don't know. I've, I'm definitely very, like, um, once I get, like, an idea in my head, I just go for it, and I'll, like, do whatever I can to make it possible, so that has how I've always been, so, like, once I knew that I wanted to go, I was like, all right, I'm going to just do everything I can. And I like, I, I wrote my essay and, all, and did all like the paperwork within like, I think it was like six days or something because the deadline was coming up by the time I like found the school. Um, so, but I like really, you know, I've, I've had a faith, my, in faith in God my whole life. And as a queer person, people have tried to take that away from me and they can't. And a lot of times when I'm at, at my speeches, those um, shows, those people, like they ask questions or I have people like younger people that ask me questions like, does God still love me? And it's like, those are the questions that I like have inspired me to learn as much as I can so that I could be there for, for those people. Um, and like last year I had, I had these um, uh, pro protesters sh uh, show up at my, one of my concerts and they had like a megaphone and they were trying to use uh, Bible quotes to try to like be hateful against us. And I just kept singing and I, and I had, I was like, everyone needs to sing with me. Like, let's all sing together. And we were able to like drown them out and mm -hmm. they, they left, you know? And it's like just moments like that where I'm like, all right, I need to learn as much as I can. Cause right now, like, I don't have enough knowledge to um, have conversations with people that, think they know the Bible that well. Like, I don't have enough knowledge for that. And, and I say that openly and that like, that's why I'm in school because I need to learn this. Um, so I know there's a lot for me to learn. And that's what I'm saying. Like, I have to learn all that so I could be a better activist in this world, in this lifetime. So um, yeah, that's like, these are things that drove me. And also like the community aspect of it has been very important and empowering for me. Um, this is really like, since I've been at PSR, this has been the first time where I feel I have a community of activists around me that get it because people that don't do activist work, they don't understand the burden of it and the feeling of heaviness and like how sometimes like you just need a hug and you just need to hear people say like, hey, I support what you're doing and like, let me know what I could do to help too. And for me at PSR, that's been my experience and that's been just so empowering for me to be part of. Like my classmates, I've, even though we're on Zoom, like I, I feel so close to them and we've gotten to meet in person a bunch now, like at this point. And it's just, I don't know. It's a different type of person that is so supportive of one another. Um, I mean, I could go on and on about the community aspect of it, but it's definitely one of like the high points for me is the, is the PSR community. Yeah. Thank you, Brian, and, uh, for that powerful testimony to your experience here and, and delighted as the president of PSR. <laughs> your experience has been uh, so rich as uh, we hope for it to be. Uh, and, and in some ways, you know, that it has been the case across uh, the years, as Loie described, 
uh, even though you describe your own experience. Um, uh, we have with us uh, on the uh, webinar today, or at least in, in the audience today, Ela Andrew Raymer, whose phenomenal stories, uh, I hope you have a chance to read if you have not. Uh, uh, his work uh, is now part of our archives and we're working on the archives of CLGS uh, uh, on some of his work and letters and writings and so uh, delighted to have a question from him that will be the, the question we'll close with and I'll, I'll go ahead and share that a little bit and, and rephrase it perhaps a little bit but uh, invite us to close with uh, you know your last question is are there stories of inclusion uh, uh, that inspire you and that you share in community from from scriptures from sacred texts uh there was a question earlier about interfaith work which is really central at one of our round tables in clgs is the jewish round table we're also doing work to try to develop a muslim round table uh, but i want to invite you to close our time together what stories sacred stories sacred either from scripture or from other places are stories of inclusion that that comfort that challenge that bring justice that you want to encourage us to to pay attention to and that's for both of you. <laughs> I'll say for that, I, I would like to pass it to Loie. Oh, that's a really <laughs> wonderful question. Um, but the I'll tell you what the image that came to my head and and maybe you know it's it's based on all the in, in sacred texts. Jewish, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, there are always stories about eating together, mm. about food and sharing food, whether it's manna in the desert, you know, that God provides so they can survive, whether it's communion, the Eucharist. Um, the image that came to my head was the, um, that picture of tables that were set along the Mexico US border so people could come together to eat. Um, that for me is uh, the image that's there. Come for all are welcome. There's food for you. There is nourishment for you. Whether you're hungry uh, for food or hungry for the spirit, it is, it is here for you. So that, that image came to my mind. Well, thank you both very much. And uh, Ryan, there was a question about your next show. You want to talk a bit? We're excited. Uh, you know, this uh, it, it's Pride Month, and uh, we are proud of both of you and your work. And Ryan, you're going to share a little bit about the activities this weekend during Pride Week in San Francisco. Sure. Thank you. So on Friday, I am performing at the Trans March, which is at Dolores Park, and the, we will march to Civic Center and. I'm inviting anyone that wants to march with me to please come find us. Um, you'll find us on the stage. And then we would love to march with you. Everyone's welcome to march. And then we will also be playing at San Francisco Pride on Saturday. Outstanding. So we look forward to those events and encourage folks to participate. Uh, this has been a delightful <laughs> conversation, powerful, inspiring. Thank you both. Uh, for your testimony, you. for your work, for your uh, dedication to all of yeah. you who have been attentive tonight and engaged. We encourage you to share. Uh, the, this has been recorded, will be shared as part of our series of webinars. And so I encourage, uh, encourage you to come back and listen to that uh, and uh, also to share it with others. Uh, <clears throat> we are, uh, you heard Ryan's experience, you heard Boy's experience and how consistent PSR has been over generations. Uh, registra uh, registration is open. We hope you will consider a, a checking out an opportunity to be prepared uh, for your own leadership, for the preparation uh, for work in the society and the community. Uh, while we are deeply rooted in the conviction that religious communities, faith traditions, the ancient wisdom of our communities has value, significance, and importance, uh, we do so with a broad understanding of what that means. Uh, and so we invite as a community both a to, to tell the stories that are compelling and important to us and to find ways to engage them as we engage also the large stories of our society. So as I say often to uh, folks engage with us as students, we make three commitments at PSR and I hope this event has fulfilled those to you, that we commit ourselves to blow your mind, to embolden your heart 
and to strengthen your hands. I certainly Thank have you. had in this conversation my mind blown and my commitments reframed by the testimony of both of you and your lives and your work and your words. I have also been definitely, my heart has been warmed and strengthened and my skills, my ability to do the work that I do. And I hope that is the case for all of you who are listening tonight. Thank you very much. Have a great night and our gratitude to our team that helped us to prepare for tonight. Have a good night. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Good night.